show. This podcast is called Obsessed. Joseph Scrimshaw and his guest get some secrets off their chest. You should listen. It's the best. Hello and welcome to Obsessed with me, Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm sitting in my home with an amazing actor and a voice actor. He acts with his body and his voice and maybe even his mind, Darren DePaul. Hello, Joseph. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much uh, for coming and doing this. Well, I was a fan of the podcast, as I have told you many times. I listen to it and love it, and it's really exciting. And I'm sort of like, I'm here. I'm doing this. How is this happening? (laughs) Well, I am honored that you are wearing a suit and tie. It's just a vest and a tie. Yeah, well, but but that's pretty fancy for a podcast. Well, if I can be the Paul F. Tompkins of the voiceover <laughs> world, I always like to dress. My father was a clothing designer. I grew up in okay. Palm Beach and Florida, and we went to, like, prep school. So I feel comfortable yeah. in dress-up stuff. Do you ever get any comments? Do you ever go anywhere with a vest and a tie or a full suit, and people go, like, why are you suited up? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> Why are you so formal? Do you just lie and say, like, well, I'm on my way yeah. to a banquet? I-, I got a thing. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, what thing? Oh, it's a thing, you know. I have a thing for suits. Exactly. Yeah, yeah so that's But, fine. you know, I like the way I feel in it. Uh, body issues, you know, and all that thing. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I look a little more put together now. So. I'm going to start doing that because I, I want to wear a suit more. I'm going to wear a suit. And then when people ask me why, I'm just going to say body issues in or, like a really cool way, like I'm yeah. James Bond or something. Body issues. <laughs> issues. Body issues. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No problem. Can you tell people listening a little bit about like who you are, what you do, your background? Oh, uh, I'm Darren DePaul. I was an actor um, in New York for many years, did uh, Broadway, off-Broadway, regional theater, national tours, and then started doing voiceover. Uh, did a whole bunch of commercials. I do the Geico, the storybook ads. When they're oh, turning really? the pages, I've been doing that for seven years. <laughs> and uh, that kind of let us come here and try this L.A. adventure about three and a half years ago. And uh, we thought we'd be here six months and we're still here. And just now I do a whole bunch of games and animation and work on films and still do commercials. Uh, I'm Reinhardt in Overwatch. Okay. Uh, they like that. Arden Azunia in Final Fantasy XV. Uh, I'm in Doom, I'm in a lot of Blizzard games, Star Wars, uh, Emperor Valkorion in okay. Star Wars. And that's the, the Old Republic? The Old Republic. Okay. And they've let me do like a week way for Star Wars Battlefront, because they're like, <laughs> do you want to do lines in Hatties? I'm like, the doy. Of course I want to. <laughs> and I found that my musical theater background, because once you look at the language, you're like, oh, it's that. I get the phrasing, I get the arc of that. Okay. You know, the donkey by the walker. And you're like, oh, sure. What, what are you actually saying is the week way? It's, they'll have the English translation next to it. Okay. But I, I know, what was it? The bonky was like sort of, that's the gun or something. Okay. Equate the bonky. You know, and you're like kind of looking at it and it's all variations of place the mine. Uh, I'm over here. Okay, so you're saying like super standard video Super game standard stuff. stuff. Like, all right, the body armor. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But it's like, you're the bonky. <laughs> you know? That is great. And now, uh, I don't play Overwatch, but I know it's like the kind of big video game uh, for people right now. I can't play video games because I have a problem. <laughs> but maybe I'll get around to Overwatch. But can you tell me a little bit about who Reinhardt is? Reinhardt is this big, giant German in a suit of armor (laughs) who is kind of Quixote in a lot of ways because he's just over the top. He's this big, wonderful, lovable guy, but maybe there's a little madness in there. We don't know. They described him to me as like having, maybe he's got a van with the armor in the back and he's looking for wrongs to right. (laughs) My friend, come here. We shall solve this problem together. (laughs) He's not a small character. He's a big, drunken adventurer. He's a big guy with a big voice and... It's kind of based on my dad, like, three levels up. Nice. My dad was uh, Russian but born in Germany, so he had a very unique accent, and I loved that. We'd have a lot of people over. My father would have okay. a lot of European people over when we were younger, and just this flood of accents would come upstairs. So it's a lot of that stuff. <laughs> Did um, you try to master him when you were a kid? Were you yes. Like... <laughs> I was very lonely. I had no friends. But I, I can talk like to myself. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Oh, that's pretty cool. So let's get into your obsession. Mm. Uh, like many people, I emailed you to be on the show and said, hey, what you're interested in? And you said, I can't believe we haven't done this. Shakespeare. I am amazed that I have not covered Shakespeare yet. Uh, because I have a background in theater. You know, I started this podcast in Minneapolis where I've had many people on the podcast that have done Shakespeare. And I know like Shakespeare, nobody ever said like, hey, I really want to do Shakespeare. So I'm glad that I finally have a Shakespeare obsessed person. Thank you. <laughs> so how did you first get like hooked on Shakespeare? How did Shakespeare come into your life? 
first thing was in college. Uh, I went to college in Florida, and there was another college, Florida Atlantic University, was doing Romeo and Juliet. And there was this fabulous production. I just remember it to this day. The prince came out at the beginning and stood with his back to the audience so that he could talk to both families. And I was like, well, that's against all staging. Wow, but that's so cool. And the Mercutio was so funny. And I loved it. Then I went away from Shakespeare. Then I moved to New York in like the 80s, and Ian McKellen acting Shakespeare was on Broadway. And he even brought people up at one point. And my dad and really? I got to go up on stage with McKellen. And, you know, he was doing scenes and things, just explaining what would be and that sort of thing and how Macbeth would be done in this age. And <laughs> I think we played soldiers. And when he gestured, we all died. And he spoke over us and eulogized. And <laughs> it was super cool. And then I went away from it again. I would see things at the Delacorte, which is Shakespeare in the Park in New okay. York. Uh, like Kevin Klein in Richard III, which was amazing. Um, some wonderful Midsummers. But then when I got hooked is because my wife, Deborah Cardona, was a dramaturg and had worked on Shakespeare a lot. I was complaining about musicals. They didn't have my sensibility. Like, uh, what's your sensibility? We do a lot of musical theater, or we did. And I love Python. I love SCTV. Okay. Uh, I love Bleak Expectations, which is a, a, an English podcast. Uh, it's sort of a Dickens takeoff. Okay. And there was nothing that had my kind of humor. Right. And Deborah was like, well, shut up and write it. <laughs> if you're going to complain, just try. So I kept writing and writing and writing and then learning about Shakespeare, watching Shakespeare, because I wanted to do a musical version of Macbeth. Cause, nice. Because why not? And I fell in love. I started getting, like, obsessed about it. We went to England. We went to Stratford-on-Avon. We did the whole tour. We went to his house. We saw stuff at the Globe. And I was going, this theater thrills me. The language just washes over you. And yeah. every different choice that a different company will make. Um, when we were there at uh, the Royal Shakespeare Company at Stratford, they were doing Lear with McKellen, another okay. brush with McKellen. Uh, <laughs> did you say, I was a soldier, I died for you? We did see him. We were <laughs> on our way to Anne Hathaway's house, and he was just standing <laughs> on the street. You were on your way to Anne Hathaway's house? We were going to look at Anne Hathaway's house. Okay. We were like, so we had to pass the theater. And there is Sir Ian. And we had just seen the Lear the night before. So we passed him. We're like, Serene, we adored your Lear. We saw it last night. And he went, good. <laughs> we moved on. <laughs> we're like, that's it. You got a good review uh, for yes. your compliment. But really. it was this amazing Lear. And then the next night, we saw a production of Midsummer that Tim Supple had directed. And it was in seven different Indian languages and English. And you didn't miss a word. Okay. It was thrilling. So... I'm so uh, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, no. So uh, when you started to become obsessed with Shakespeare, was it just because you were becoming obsessed with Shakespeare or were you finding some of what you were missing in musicals of your own sensibility of comedy in Shakespeare? Probably a little bit of both, because when I got hooked on the language and the performance style, I went, oh, there's a lot that you can do here. There's interpretations, there's different, you know, and it just the staging of it and the sheer theatricality as an actor. Yeah. I went, this I love, this I adore. And were you coming at it mostly from, I want to see this, read this, make this more part of my life? Or was it more, I want to do this now? I haven't done it as much? Both. I tried to do it. I worked at New Jersey Shakespeare for three years. They would not even audition me for Shakespeare because I did musicals. Really? So Is this before the Shakespeare yes, Awakening? Yes, before the Shakespeare okay. Awakening. And it's like, that, but that was it. And I'm going, but I want to do it. Uh, I got cast in a production of um, um, Midsummer, yeah, at uh, the Classical Theater of Harlem. Okay. I had done a wonderful production of Ma Rainey with you know, August Wilson being, I think, the modern Shakespeare, if you will. Okay. And then the whole thing got canceled. It got, I was going to be Peter Quince, and I was so thrilled. <laughs> and they went, we're not going to do this one. I can see you being Peter Quince. It's a great like straight man role that you can get a ton of comedy out of. Exactly. I was so thrilled. I'm like, finally, I get my chance. And then I sort of veered away from it. Yeah. Did you ever end up making Macbeth the musical? We did. Um, we did it as a, a, a musical, an original musical. Okay. And it was done at Penn State to try it out. It got some good success, but I had some problems with the guys that wrote the music and the song. We just didn't match. Okay. I was looking for my sensibility and they didn't get it either. So we broke off. We did a reading in New York with a lot of the cast of Rock of Ages who then became my friends. And Mitch Jarvis, who was Lonnie in the original uh, version, he played Shakespeare in this crazy version of Macbeth. And he called me one night. He's like, okay, I was listening to Michael Bolton 
<laughs> it's the show. And I rewrote it that night. I was like, it's as if Michael Bolton wrote songs for Shakespeare. And then Mitch and I started developing William Shakespeare's McBolton. <laughs> and we're like, how is this? How does this? It's working. It's working. And the Rock of Ages guys, we did a reading. And we were, you know, we were constantly there trying to get yeah. the Bolton. Bolton D. Snyder tried to get it to Michael Bolton. Because he was in Rock of Ages at the <laughs> That's time. That's one of my favorite sentences now. Yes. D. Snyder tried to get it. I sat talking Shakespeare Bolton. with D. Snyder. He <laughs> loves Shakespeare. And it just never happened. Yeah. I think Bolton was just doing the rise with, you know, into comedy and working with Lonely Island. And Yeah, yeah. And he was busy making fun of himself. Exactly. He didn't need any help with that right. at that point. Well, ours is was a tribute to him because I think his songs are very raw and theatrical like Shakespeare. They're very, you know your heart explodes in a lot of these numbers. Right. They're, uh, they are sort of like directly addressing the audience. Exactly. And I think that's why some people don't like them because they are too just like, I am saying what I mean. Yeah. And there's no level of irony or distance. But you can twist them. Yeah. And we did. And we love it. It's in a drawer. You, you know, we keep going, yeah. I wonder one day. <laughs> we'll, do a, we'll do Obsessed with Bolton for sure. Oh, uh, please. Since you, you seem to know the oeuvre of Michael Bolton as well Learning as Michael Bolton and Shakespeare together <laughs> and going, they actually work. This is crazy. Well, if I ever do a remount of my Macbeth show, I will absolutely cast you in it. I did a show for the Minnesota Fringe Festival uh, called Macbeth's Awesome Scottish Castle Party. <laughs> and it was a mashup of Macbeth and interactive theater. Because at the time in Minneapolis, interactive theater was just exploding and making a ton of money. So the kind of the normal theater world was really looking down its nose at it. So it was really a mashup of, you know, the show was a discussion of what are the commonalities between these two and what are the different perspectives about how you can enjoy it and not in highbrow and lowbrow. And uh, yeah, a friend of mine uh, played the role of Banquo, which was really demanding because everybody else, the shtick was basically that. Uh, I played Macbeth and was also sort of myself who was trying to do this loud, exciting, audience interactive version of Macbeth. And the guy playing Banquo was like, I want to do it traditionally. So he was the only one doing the actual Shakespeare lines. Everybody else was paraphrasing, but he was limited to Banquo's actual lines. Uh, and I can see you playing the comedy of that very well. I loved it. Now, yeah. Ed... Have you done Shakespeare here in Los Angeles? No, no, no. I haven't done any theater in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. uh, so I've done a bunch of different like uh, Shakespeare shows like that that are like comedy takes mm -hmm. on on Shakespeare, sort of thinking about it. And then I did two actual Shakespeare shows. I've done Macbeth and I did a Midsummer Night's Dream. Midsummer was a good production and Macbeth was a comically horrific production. Just beautifully everything about it was uh, the director decided that it needed to be a commentary on uh, Bush-era America. This was like 2004, and took all of Macbeth's power away and gave it to the witches. And like, the witches are like Ari Fleischer, whispering in Macbeth's ear. So he like reblocked it so Macbeth would be like, I like almost like a shrugging emoticon of like, I don't know what to do. And then a witch would whisper in his ear. And then Macbeth would be like, evil thing, go uh. do that. And there was Metallica music and yeah. All sorts of they uh, they ran out of time. This was a good company too, and they ran uh -huh. out of time for costuming. And I was playing Banquo and then the Porter, and they ran out of time for costuming for the Porter. And I was like, I have this actual like Laura Ashley tartan skirt that I've worn for Shakespeare sketches. <laughs> Should I wear that as the Porter? I'm like, sure. So I just had a Laura Ashley skirt <laughs> as the Porter. Sometimes you have to. Yeah. yeah. There's a great version. And they filmed it. It was done at the Folger Theater uh, in Washington. And it's it comes with the script, if you can find the Folger Theater version, that, that Teller co-directed. So the magic is just amazing. Oh, yeah, I bet. Yeah, and it's on video. So if you can find that, if anybody's listening and wants to see it, it was a, Aaron Posner co-directed it and Teller. And Banquo's ghost appears and disappears right, you know, oh. right there. And you're like, how okay. is this happening? Yeah, that's amazing. I had to walk my own chair on. I thought about that. There was, they, they tried to do, like, somebody made a loud noise, and then I walked on with my own chair as Banquo's ghost. Very, very rude, <laughs> I thought. So do you have, like, this aching hole in your soul that you like Shakespeare so much, you know so much about it, and you haven't performed it when yes. you are a performer? Yes. because Well, you always want to. It's a challenge where yeah. you can get that verbiage and make it real and make it so that it's not just da-da-da-da-da. There's a great story um, that Mark Rylance tells. Mark Rylance, do you know? Do you know Mark Rylance? I don't know him personally. Okay. Yeah, I, he's, oh no, he's, <laughs> he's here. By the way, he's, he's in my bathroom. Actually, we see him do a lot of stuff, and and just someone that I'm really, you know, I aspire to that level of clarity on Shakespeare. But he was telling a story about early on doing uh, um, uh, Hamlet. Okay, and he goes, he was very pausy 
when he did it. And it was a very small house when yeah. he was younger, and the audience was very close. And he went, to be or not to be? And a lady in the front turned to her husband and went, that is the question. <laughs> and so all that he could do is look at her and go, that is the question. <laughs> Whether it is nobler in the mind to saw And do the thing to her, yeah. which is a different take on the speech. And it's like, well, how do you make it real and in the moment? Yeah, just, how do you make it a conversation? Yeah, not just to be or not to be. That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind. No, it's how is this done? Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting because there is such, I've encountered such two different schools of thought of play with it, make it your own, how do you do it? And then I've encountered the other school of thought that is, it is the poetry and you must be exactly true to the poetry and too much playing with it makes it not Shakespeare. Which Shakespeare is the poetry. To? Oh, play with it. I'm, yeah. a, I'm a play with it kind of guy. <laughs> it's just in general and in every way. I understand wanting to like, so, certainly like some of the meaning and some of the jokes are in the rhythm and I understand some parts you want to have the rhythm. Yeah. But I don't know. It's, it, it, it's my bias because those are the people who have felt like the Shakespeare police who are like, I have the knowledge and I can tell you how to enjoy it and how to do it. And obviously, I but that's, that's not Shakespeare. What the blockage yeah, for is, most people, you know, is for the people. If you yeah. see it at the Globe in London, it's yeah. just this raucous, fun night, whether it's a fellow or one of the comedies. Yeah. It's going to be fun. Because that's, I think, what Shakespeare did. You know, tickle the ears of the groundlings kind of thing. Yeah. And because we, we did see Othello and then we saw Henry Ford. At the Globe in, in yeah. London. Yeah. Henry, uh, Roger Allen doing uh, uh, Falstaff was brilliant. Oh, Because it wasn't bet. just the big, jolly Falstaff. It was this wonderful, regal, sarcastic Falstaff. A, just a very different interpretation. Yeah. And it worked beautifully. Yeah. And I think there's clips on YouTube. Oh, cool. I'll have to check that out. I I saw a part of Titus Andronicus uh, with my wife, Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a super hot day. She already wasn't feeling well, but she's like, I want to go. But she got, she just was like, we were standing. And yeah, she's like, like and, and I was like, oh, there's beer. I'm going to stand and drink beer. And we're like, and she was trying to have a beer. And she's like, I just, I need to sit down. Uh, so we went outside and we just sat down on a bench and just Sarah just uh, kind of put her head down for a moment. Uh, and the actress who is playing Lavinia, I believe that, you know, the character who had lost her, you know, oh, yeah. tongue and, and, and various limbs or whatnot. Yeah. She she walked past us in between scenes with like a robe on, but still like all caked in her horrific blood makeup and was like. Are you all right? <laughs> so it's like even that we didn't even make it through the whole show and we still got this very visceral real it's not too far away from us experience yeah. because it is just happening all around you even outside of the world of the play is you know you're that, inside it that staging at the globe is i think the way to to see theater i love that thrust with the audience yeah. all around you i think it really there's not a bad seat then yeah and it just makes it more immediate and thrilling yeah sometimes absolutely. when we you know i think when we did the St. James Theater, it's like, what, 1,500 seats, but it's all up, and you're, like, so removed from people. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think there's an energy, yeah. you know, even for thrusts, you know, people can still find a way to lock thrusts down. Exactly. Uh, but speaking of your desire to play Shakespeare, yes. I'm wondering if we can do the obnoxious thing and, and play with the voice actor. Do you have a, a favorite line that you'd be willing to do in some of your characters' voices? Tomorrow. And Tomorrow. And tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle life's a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard from no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That is awesome. Emperor Valkorion doing the speech. <laughs> I love that speech. And it's just because, it, again, the rhythm of it. And it's like, I remember uh, Ian McKellen broke that down. Yeah. And it's like the weight of that last nothing and the, the plodding weight of the words of tomorrow and tomorrow, and to you know, yeah, just has such great acting potential. In yeah, it. I, I think that. that is probably my favorite passage. Oh, so that's awesome that you would select that. I'm also like I say, I'm a video game player. I haven't been doing it as much, but yeah, that voice that you've selected for that character sounds both so regal and Shakespearean, and so appropriate for a video game bad guy. That's yes. That 
I felt inspired to like hit the button <laughs> to play the scene. Like, okay. no, no, I can, I can change it. It'll be okay, Emperor Falcorian. I can change what's going to happen. I'll no, play you video. can't. <laughs> Your power does not equal mine, for I am one with the Force. <laughs> That's awesome. That was I had done. Um, like eight hours of work on the Warcraft movie, okay. like yelling as an orc for eight hours. My voice was shot. <laughs> Words or just yelling? Words and yelling and fighting. And okay. it was just, God, you will die, kind of stuff. And I was toast. And this audition came in. It was absolutely beautiful. It wasn't marked. And it was the speech of Valkorion for the trailer uh, that we did Sacrifice. And I'm like, well, this is gorgeous. I have no voice. Oh, they kind of want to... Tywin Lannister thing. Let me see if I can croak it out. Okay. And I just did like one or two takes on it, sent it off going, that'll never happen. Yeah. And then it became this big thing. Oh, that, really? And oh, I like, did. Oh, that was perfect. I did him for like two years. <laughs> and I'm going, oh, I know I have to repeat that. Now I have to find, you know, that gravel and yeah. thing and just make it as low as I can. And you don't have to scream like an orc first every he time. He raised his voice once in two years. <laughs> and I love it because uh, um, he's such a badass that he doesn't have to scream. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff, you know, you love that, that the power is just there simmering. Like in Shakespeare, you're going yeah. to Shakespeare King that doesn't have to yell to be frightening. Or to, you do know he's going to go to war, but it's just the resolve. Yeah. But it, I wanted to do it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, but I wanted to do the comedies. Like Malvolio would have been my, I was like, please let me play Malvolio. Yeah. yeah. In, in I, Twelfth Night. That I think been. you'd be amazing at that. Um, I also wanted to ask you some yeah. sort of questions about Shakespeare himself. Mm. Now, if you could like meet Shakespeare and have a drink with him, the person as well as the legend, you know, what would you want to ask him about? Why did you leave your wife all those <laughs> years in Stratford and just having so many parties in London? No, um, I guess You'd give every... him some marriage counseling. Exactly, I that's a good I idea. I guess everyone would say, "Did you? Did you write it?" Yeah. Did you really write it? Because we think you did. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that have no evidence or, or very, you know, substantial evidence that don't think you wrote it. Yeah. So did you? And do you think you'd just say, well, of course. Yeah. Well, Look at this. Good. Of course I wrote it. <laughs> what are you talking about? Look. It's very fun. <laughs> peace and love. Peace and love. It's like all of a sudden he's, he's Ringo. Yeah, he's the fifth Beatle. Yeah. yeah the sixth Beatle, I guess, yeah. right? Um, I guess that would be. I mean, that would be a dumb thing. But what would you ask him? What, uh, what is your inspiration? How did you? I mean, one of the reasons yeah. that they said, uh, um, oh, I'm forgetting, uh, the big person that they say could have written Shakespeare. Uh, Francis Bacon? Not Francis Bacon. Uh, there's another, there's like an Earl or a Duke, or I, I should yeah, know this. Yeah, I can't remember. But they're either. going, okay, uh, he once took a very bad sea voyage, so obviously he wrote The Tempest. I mean, they hang it on <laughs> that kind of stuff. And you're yeah. going, it's, I think it's the Earl of Southampton. And, and you're like, no, I yeah. think there was this guy who somehow had this genius, and in the time could tell these stories. Yeah. This country bumpkin that all of a sudden saw the world in a different way. Yeah, I find it odd that people marvel that he wrote it all because he had time, right? I mean, it's not like he was on Twitter all day. Uh, so, the, I mean, I think there is a, like, a lack of perception about it's a different era, different time. Yeah. It, was, it was his job a lot of the time, right? Um, I think, I think uh, asking him, did you, would be a great opening question because that would introduce the question to him of like, well, why... Why would people think I didn't? Yeah. Oh, and also, did you really move the theater across the Thames when they <laughs> shut you down? Because didn't he do that overnight? Yeah, I think that's the legend. Yeah, the, I think that's so cool. Yeah. That they just dismantled it because they couldn't perform over there. They dismantled the whole theater, got it across the Thames, and built it. Yeah. Would you uh, try to figure out if he was... I feel like modern pop culture right now is really playing with the sort of the bad boy. Which you kind of led with of like, oh, he's not with his wife. He's, yeah. uh, you know, hanging out in London, having a party, getting drunk and finding muses. Uh, it's sort of that poetic bad boy. Yeah. Uh, would you try to figure out if that was real? Yes, I think I would. Because, you know, it would be cool to think of him like me as this geek. It was like, <laughs> this is cool. I'm going to write a story. It's going to be very nice. You go out and have fun. I'm writing about these two lovers and they're going to die. Bye. <laughs> I'm just having a good time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, look, this will be cool. There'll be a nurse. Yeah. She'll be fun. <laughs> you know? Like playing with Star Wars action figures. Right. And everybody's going, oh, Will, do come out with us. No, look, it's going to be great. Right. Like it's his own personal D&D. &D. Like, yeah. I'm writing my stories. I'm Maybe my that's, adventures. yeah. It's 
that's what I think. I think it'd be cool. <laughs> that's awesome. Do you feel like people doubt that he wrote the plays because there's a, a almost a pessimism that it's impossible that one person could have this many thoughts, this much brilliance? But don't they think, you know, like, how could this athlete be that good? How yeah. could this person? Maybe it's just some kind of magic that happens with people. Yeah. I, you know, I'm an artist, so you kind of go, yeah, I want to think that. Right. That it just, he was touched by the muses, and somehow this happened. Yeah. And that thrills me, instead of, no, no, it had to be. When I was in, I'm a very boring person, and <laughs> I, I never... You know, they said, don't drink, don't... I went to Catholic school, and they're like, don't drink, don't smoke, don't do drugs. I'm like, okay, I'm just doing theater. And <laughs> I, re- action figures. I remember there was a bonfire, because I grew up in Florida. Don't go to bonfires. And one of the techies was like, how could you ever play a druggie because you don't do drugs? And I was like, I have an imagination, <laughs> and I'm watching you. Yeah. So maybe that was Shakespeare going, I didn't live it, but I have an imagination. I've heard stories being told in different ways. I'm going to steal from this playwright, and you won't know I'm going to steal from that playwright, but... This is how I'm creating yeah. the story. Well, and so much of it was current events, as I understand it. I, I only know Macbeth uh, deeply, and I know your wife is a, a dramaturg. Yeah. I, Macbeth is the only thing that I've ever been through, like, the dramaturg process. But uh, uh, that was eye-opening to me of, like, how much of it was about, like, this is the political issue of the day, so I'm going to work that in as a theme. So Yeah, he I think did it to things... sort of butter up the king. Because yeah. Macbeth was not a bad guy. yeah. And it was the idea, I remember in particular, because yeah. I really related to it, was the, the idea of equivocation. How yeah. much the actual theme of equivocation of, is it the truth or is it just bending the truth? Uh, because I think that was an issue of, in the day of, of uh, trials about um, the, the attack on the parliament. Um, and, well, and, and also with King James, he just, he, want, he was a pig. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he like have parties where he'd be covered in jam and stuff? And then Shakespeare had to perform for him. You read about, you know, <laughs> doing all this research. I was like reading all these Shakespeare books and it's like, okay, so he's trying to please King James, this crazy Scotsman who didn't want to go to the theater and just wanted to have crazy sex parties and stuff. And then, you know, <laughs> let's see what you're going to do, Willie. <laughs> you know? And it's like, okay, I'm doing this thing about this king from Scotland. Oh, sounds good. You know, yeah. what's next, Willie? <laughs> and there are witches and spooky stuff. But, you know, so. Yeah. Because you yeah, understand you like witches, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, he did. He was really into witchcraft. Yeah. James. So yeah. it was taking all that stuff and going, you know. Yeah, so I think uh, there, he was, he's pulling from what's around him yeah. as well as yeah. pulling from old text. Do you think there is a level of Shakespeare confirmation bias? This will take me just a second. But uh, I feel like, yes, obviously Shakespeare is brilliant, mm-hmm. one of the most brilliant people who ever lived. I don't doubt that. But I do sometimes wonder about a level of confirmation bias where we find brilliance in Shakespeare because it is one of the facts that just culturally you know from an early age. You know that... The moon is there. The sun rises on this side. Shakespeare is brilliant. Don't touch the stove. Like, Shakespeare is brilliant is just sort of baked into us at an early age. So I feel like sometimes when people come to it, they're like so willing to find the brilliance. And I think with Shakespeare, it is there. But I wonder sometimes if we were to approach other things with that absolute belief that brilliance is there, if we would find it in other places. That's true. but And to be fair, I've seen some bad Shakespeare. <laughs> you mean uh, productions? Productions. Or you feel like, do you have any lines where you're like, oh, Willie, that's not a good line? No, I, I can't think of any. I'm sure there might be. You're like, well, that was kind of dumb. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I've seen some bad productions that just did not did not get it or tried to, you know, just make it goofy yeah. instead of staying with the story. Tell the story. Right. The story is exciting enough. Well, what would you say you would want to approach as brilliant? That isn't approached as brilliant. Because, you know, Star Wars, everybody loves Star Wars. Yeah, and I feel like Star Wars is a good example where enough people have, you know, going back 20 years now to the, oh, Joseph Campbell power of the myth that people are willing to dive into it as a text and find out what ideas are there that aren't immediately obvious on the surface. Um, But I'm trying to think of a good example, like Seinfeld. Like, if you were raised from birth that the sitcom Seinfeld is like one of the greatest perspectives on humanity ever on the true human condition. And if Which you were like raised from birth, <laughs> if you would start finding all of these tiny little things. But but there are tiny little things in Seinfeld, don't you feel? I do. Yeah. I do, but I don't know if the, if the I don't no. know if Seinfeld I need to find the right example. Three's company. Three's How company. about Three's Company? Yeah, you're right. That, that, that. And yes, I watched it. I'm old enough to go. I watched it in prime time. But if they went, yes, this is this is absolute brilliance. It's French farce. Yeah. And, you know, it's door slamming and being in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
No, it's not. It's it was fun and entertaining at the time. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. But I don't know. But Shakespeare has proven to be brilliant over and over again by different interpretations. Yeah. Um, I've seen a lot of Macbeths because I was doing it. I saw Patrick Stewart do it. it was phenomenal. You know, and just different takes on the story. Like you said, different locations, different time periods. Yeah. Some work, some don't. If the material wasn't brilliant to begin with, then it wouldn't lend itself to those yeah. different interpretations. Yeah. Absolutely. I think more than anything, I don't think I have any sort of beef with Shakespeare is as brilliant as everybody thinks. And yeah. I think he wrote it all himself. Um, I think I'm just sort of uh, almost culturally jealous of that accepted idea that he is brilliant in wish that we would have that level of commitment to other things. Because I think as a, as a culture, we're willing to write things off. We're willing to decide quickly, like, I am the arbiter. I just saw a new thing. And I can just say it is bad. The point, and of instead my, of going, yeah. ah, everybody around me assumes it's brilliant. So uh, that's that's what it is. I wish we would approach more things with the assumption of brilliance. That was we the point of Shakespeare, of that Nick way. Bolton. Oh, really? Yeah. At the end, you're like these. If you love them, if they tell the story and they move you, they're equal. Oh, Michael nice. Bolton music or Shakespeare, they can come together and speak to you. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like Comic-Con when you go to San Diego and they're like, if you like Power Rangers, it's there. Come on in. Yeah. If you like Star Wars, you know, we're not letting anyone out. We're all welcome because what you love, if it speaks to you, there's a brilliance and a magic in that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, would you ever want Shakespeare to write a play about you? Oh, no. I'm so boring. <laughs> He'd be like, please, just drink and carouse a bit. We're like, <laughs> yeah, I can't just do... He goes to the comic shop on a Wednesday and then records auditions at night and likes his wife. <laughs> you know, it's like... But I feel like one of the things that is brilliant about Shakespeare is that he is a, a, a student of humanity okay. and he finds the truth in each individual human. If he were to write someone, my, my folks got very ill uh, and, and passed away horribly. I'm sorry to change the subject, but and people are like, you should write a play about that. I'm like, I don't need to write a play about that. If people wanted to see it, I'd invite them into a theater, put a brick under every seat, and then let them beat themselves with a brick for two hours. And that would have been what I went through trying to save my parents for two years. So maybe if Shakespeare went, let's take this tragedy told from the point of view of someone who works in comedy and works in theater and tries not to take himself too seriously. Yeah. How do I tell that story and make it hopeful? Okay. Yeah, I can see Sorry, that. I brought it down. No, 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 no. Like, that's, no, hey, I like... I but like, that part I like of my life, I would go, yeah. Yeah, and I yeah. think that's a great theater exercise yeah. uh, to invite the audience to hit themselves with things. Oh, <laughs> that's super... That's all I could think of, because for two years, it's like, this can't get any worse. Oh, it got yeah. worse. Oh, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying, you know. Okay, cool. Along those same lines... Uh, cool always... that my parents suffered? No, cool Joseph, idea. cool that my <laughs> Oh, man, you're going down, Scrimshaw. Uh, sometimes I slip up with my transitions. Yeah, what was that? Your parents died? Cool. Nice, nice, whatever. Uh, I think we have a commercial read now. It's about, no, uh, no, I wanted to ask you about, I love the idea of the tragic flaw. Yeah. Do you feel like you are cognizant of your own tragic flaw? I have so many. <laughs> your tragic flaws. I have so many. Um, I try to be a Pollyanna. And I try to be a good person, and then you just get upset by things. Okay. I, you know, and yeah, there are many, many tragic flaws, and I would love not to be aware of them, but I am. <laughs> you know, thinking that, oh, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm the smartest guy in the room, but I don't want to talk to anybody because I'm scared of people. Yeah. You know, and that thing of, my father was very gregarious. Okay. My mother was brilliant, but everybody stayed at a distance. So I'm that combination of, hi, everybody, don't get too close. <laughs> okay. Know? I understand. So, you know, doing... Uh, 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 Comic Cons and stuff when when fans are like uh, you know and I'm so hi how are you oh wait I can't talk anymore I'm, <laughs> now I'm nervous yeah I've reached my wall yeah I, I know and, they come here go away yeah yeah that was you know in installed in me at an early age I guess with my parents so yeah that would be a great Shakespeare play that uh, it sounds like kind of being on the introvert extrovert line indeed and it would be interesting to, if you were like the ruler of a place and people thought you were insane because like. One day, <laughs> King Darren is very, very vocal and happy, and the next day, King Darren does not want to speak to us. One day is in the insane? 70s, in the 70s, and my dad was watching televisions in his bedroom upstairs, and there was something on 60 Minutes about, not passive-aggressive, bipolar, and he looked and went, that's you! 
<laughs> you're, you're, yeah, my dad was like, that's you. Look at the TV. That's you. You're bipolar. So get over it. You know, that was it. And I'm just like, okay, yeah, that's me. Hi. Yay. I love you. It's just like, oh, figure out your problem. Six yeah, minutes, six that's minutes. your problem. Now stop it. That was my dad. You know, this big Russian guy going, you know, stop crying. The world is bad. Stop crying. Yeah. We have to handle it. Yeah. So. And did that help? No. <laughs> There's a minute. I mean, I, when I was dealing with their problems i was very logical and very emotionless i became very vulcan like yeah trying to deal with doctors and hospitals and everything and i didn't know that i could do that i didn't know that i could be that adult yeah and so i became that person and i'd rather not do it again but yeah. i know that i could do it if i had to oh that's awesome that's awesome uh my last question for yes. this segment is if people spoke in wonderful poetry in day-to-day -day life would that be beautiful or would that be annoying that's really wonderful because I'm going, of course it would be beautiful. And then you go, no, maybe you'd get tired of it because it would always be beautiful so you wouldn't realize the beauty. That would just be the normal. Oh, yeah. So that someone then just going, hey, how you doing? Wow, they broke the mold. <laughs> There's such beauty in that simplicity <laughs> instead of, you know, this wonderful simile that goes on and twists yeah. and turns. It's just someone going, I liked it. Yeah. I, I when I thought about asking that question, I was thinking I want to believe that that would be beautiful. Yeah. But I think I would get paranoid because I also worry about my social interactions, and I feel like I'd be at the DMV or something and just want basic information. And like I know everything you're saying has a beautiful double meaning that I need to parse in the moment. And is the DMV person mocking me? Are they saying some great you know theory about war and I don't hear it? So I'm just like <laughs> I just need my license. <laughs> Hey guys, this is Sarah Meyer, co-producer of Obsessed, and usually I just head out to the streets of LA to find somebody to talk to about the week's topic, but this week I've stumbled into the filming of the show Curb Your Enthusiasm, so instead of asking random people, I'm harassing people on the set. Is Larry David the Shakespeare of our day? <laughs> Even more, because <laughs> he's putting it down. L. David, I call him, L. David. What do you say to him? You walk up to him and you say, What up, L. David? What does he say? What's up, my brother? <laughs> El Capitan said, don't talk about the show. What do you think about Shakespeare? Well, he was a good writer. I like Shakespeare. I think he's great. I think the stuff that he did was fantastic. It has a lot of meaning. It's deep. I can't give you an honest answer because I've never read Shakespeare. I, I obviously know who he is, but I've never read anything by him. But then I did hear that Shakespeare never even wrote his own stuff. I heard that. I never really studied him. I went to school and I had English 1 and English 27 and English this and that, but never well, You really skipped 26 levels. This week's topic is Shakespeare. What do you think about Shakespeare? You know Shakespeare? To be or not to be? See, I told you, he knows Shakespeare. He carries a little head around all the time. <laughs> I'm not kidding. What, like a skull? <laughs> yeah, a little skull, yeah. He goes to Hamburger Hamlet every other Friday just to honor Shakespeare. <laughs> People in Shakespeare will often have a tragic flaw. Right. Do you have a tragic flaw? Too easy. I'm easy going. People take advantage of it sometimes. Here, here at work, people always ask me to do things. I'm always doing it. Then if I say I can't do it, they get mad. Do you have a tragic flaw? None whatsoever. Life is grander for me, so none. Do I have a tragic flaw? Just that I can't stop eating. I don't think that's tragic. That is kind of tragic if you look at my stomach. This is audio only, so nobody... Oh, that's okay. So do you know the, the plot of Hamlet? So he's a prince. Right. His dad's the king. His dad's brother kills the king. So Hamlet spends the whole play trying to figure out if he should avenge the murder, if he should kill his uncle, if he should kill himself. He just doesn't know what to do. So can you just give Hamlet a pep talk right now? Tell him what to do. Go kill your uncle. <laughs> he knocked off your dad, so go take him out. The play would be a lot shorter if somebody had said that to him. We're going to move on to our How Obsessed Are You questions. These are questions I ask almost every guest or other variations of them uh, to determine your obsession level. Are you ready? Oh, I am so ready. You could call me Helen. <laughs> ready. Uh, do you think... That was really bad. I'm sorry. No, it's just fine. <laughs> just fine. Do you think about Shakespeare every day? I would say yes. I mean, he's given us so many words that you know like zany and all these different words that he developed yeah so i guess unintentionally you think about it are you are you aware are you enough of a shakespeare fan that you're aware like i just said a word that shakespeare invented that no, nobody appreciates no i i think about i mean doing what we do doing theater and 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 just acting you're always yeah. aware of it and going well how do i handle in a video game if there's a long 
you know, block of text. Yeah. Shakespeare training or, or watching it, you go, oh, okay, I see the, the frame of this, the loop of this line. So I'm going to hit that trigger word and this trigger word on that take. Okay. So I think it really helps. And you treat it like Shakespearean when you're not just going, grenade! But when it's this long, long block of text. Because a lot of times when you're doing video games, you don't see the other lines. Yeah. You don't know what's being said. You just put yourself in the moment and think about what's, you know, what's ahead of you. You've seen the line for a second. Right. And you figure it out. So I think knowing text analysis coming from that Shakespeare background of how do you make something interesting yeah, and immediate and human. Okay. So not only like the, the music and the rhythm of it, but finding meaning. Yes. And connectivity. Yeah, because it's all about what am I trying to say to you to get what I want or to yeah. convince you that I'm right. Right. You know, every villain, and I play a lot of them except for Reinhardt, they all think they're right. They're the hero of their own story. And that's that's Richard the Third. Yeah, that's all you know, if Macbeth, if you will, um, Lady Macbeth, of course. It's just, but how do I convince you? Yeah, that's a super cool connection yeah. between Shakespeare that uh, wanting to make this direct connection with the audience to be sort of powerful and raw and in the moment. And I feel like with a lot of video game stuff, it is. Uh, the traditional storytelling that you want to do that, but you're also almost always trying to get a player to do something, mm -hmm. either literally hit a button or with a cutscene, really be motivated to keep playing. That's a really cool idea. I was very lucky when we did Doom because um, I, I played this big evil robot, former scientist guy. <laughs> he put his brain in a robot. It was a cool character, it was a badass, uh, Dr. Samuel Hayden. And they were very kind. They go, look, if you feel the lines could be said a different way, why don't you try taking it? You know, I'm like, oh, second take? Oh, I can right. just sort of add a beginning, you know, add a top to it. I'm not yeah. going to change the line, but it's, you know, it's knowing that Shakespeare thing of, oh, this would flow a little better. Okay. By adding these three words. Okay. You know, and making it more of a piece. So you apply Shakespeare to your work yeah. uh, almost daily. Do you apply anything from Shakespeare in your day-to-day -day life that isn't working, but just sort of like, I'm making a decision at the grocery store? <laughs> How would Shakespeare think about this? No, <laughs> no, I would love to do that because I, I um, when we were doing uh, McBolt and we were filming some some videos and Mitch got fully dressed in the Shakespeare thing and went out and had no trouble. Okay. You know, just, in, and I would be like, no, I, I don't go out. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Would you get a Shakespeare tattoo? No. Are you not a tattoo person? I'm not a tattoo. You've met me. <laughs> I'm wearing a vest and a tie. All the better to hide your tattoos. I, I, I'm not a wild guy. I'm sorry, Deborah. My wife is sitting and watching. <laughs> she knows. I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I get a Shakespeare tattoo. What would it be, you know? Yeah. I think that, that's always the, the question with the tattoo is yeah. the, the first level is are people tattoo people to ever consider it? Yeah. Uh, and then the, the what? what you know represents that person like heck it forever or heck it, <laughs> heck it or i think you hear that pronounced a different way or something yeah of. so you could have a pronunciation guide for yeah. all the different ways you can pronounce Tybalt it. was right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. nice has shakespeare ever made you weep oh yes uh, oh yes often if you see a wonderful production and you're into it that yeah. the othello at the globe was amazing and just you get so into it yeah. and you're sitting there what i love about theater Going to theater, just not being in it, but when you're you walk in with a group of strangers, and all of a sudden you're one, you're one being, yeah, you're moved as a group. And when that happens, it's special. And when you just hear these quiet sobs around you because of what's happened in front of you, yeah, that just gives me tingles. I love that, yeah. So it has made me cry. Are you usually moved to cry during a performance? Uh, based on the actual like narrative when a character dies or have you ever cried just because like that was so beautifully delivered uh, yes yes i have um in shakespeare and also not in shakespeare my wife uh did a production of in the heights this summer and she's about to go do another one in cool. lancaster pennsylvania and i cried from beginning to end because it was <laughs> so beautiful i was like this production is so special everybody gets it this is wonderful yeah and i think um okay i'm a huge blackadder fan yeah and and uh, uh captain darling was playing Iago in that Othello. And I'm weeping at how funny and tragic and great he is. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm Tim McInerney. And I'm getting to watch him. And I'm just like, the tears are coming down. Going, <laughs> I love, I'm seeing him live. And he's so damn funny, but scary. Yeah. You know, and you go, wow, I'm so glad I'm here. Cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, so that's a great answer on the weeping. I understand the no on the tattoo. No on the tattoo. So this is kind of tattoo related mm -hmm. in a way. Would you buy underwear with Shakespeare's face on them? Sure. So, uh, yeah. 
Do you have underwear? I do not. But if you saw, if you, I was like, sure. If you saw a New York apartment, there's a lot of like Shakespeare stuff around our New York apartment. Okay, so when people walk into your home, they know that yeah, you like Shakespeare. That's yeah. immediately they obvious. Kind of, oh, look at that! Look at that! Yeah. Okay. So they might. That might be a little surprise for later. It is going to be Valentine's Day soon. <laughs> Privy. <laughs> so just a big old face of uh, William on your underwear. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Good. Good to know. Uh, would you write a poem about Shakespeare? About himself, Shakespeare himself. Yes, sure. Would I do it now? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm like, well, having written so much about him, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I wrote a lot of stuff. Yeah. And just, you know, you throw out so much material when you're writing. I was like, yeah, a poem about him would be amazing. I think he was an interesting guy. Yeah. You know, visiting Stratford-on-Avon and seeing his home and, and following the trail of his life. And I just... He's pretty darn neat. Right. So your obsession is with him as much as it is with his work, right? Yeah, I think you have to. I mean, you get to know the man that created these wonderful worlds and, you know, that you visit. Yeah. It's like being obsessed with George Lucas and uh -huh. Star Wars because, you're like, thank you, you gave us this thing that we love. Yeah. So I want to know more about you because what led you to create that. Yeah. Well, I'll make a deal with you. I yes. will write a poem about George Lucas if you write one about Shakespeare. Oh, sure. If you want to write about George Lucas, I'd love to hear that poem. That'd, that'd be uh, that'd be really good. Maybe you could uh, talk. Jar Jar might be in there. And... Oh, yes. Okay. Jar Jar will be in there. It will be Mr. okay. Happy. Mr. Happy will be in your poem. <laughs> That's great. Uh, if you hear someone say an incorrect fact about Shakespeare, do you correct them? I do not. Is that I, a general across the board? I don't correct people on facts? I'd rather not. I mean, I'll tell a story, but I hate to be that. You know, really. You I, tell a story. So Tell a story about how it affected me. If, you know, I go, okay, when I saw this production oh, nice. of Twelfth Night, this is how they did it. What do you think? Because, you know, you don't want to be that guy that's like, no, you're wrong. Yeah. It's, yeah. But that's a great answer to be like, when I hear somebody say something incorrect, I'll yeah. try to make it a teachable moment. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make an I statement. I, I'm dressed like a teacher anyway. And you kind of go, okay, well, here's this thing. Did that affect you that way? Yeah. And if they go, oh, I didn't think of it that way, then you've got something to talk about. Do you it's, have any kind of education background or influence in your family? Or did that just come no, to you I, I just naturally? Did. That sort of, that's a good education perspective of... I loved my teachers. My teachers did so much for me. I mean, I still adore all my teachers uh, that I'm meeting every day here. Okay. Every director that you meet is a teacher. So I, I love that. I okay. love being able to communicate to people. So... That's a really strong thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, when we grew up, because I'm older than you, uh, <laughs> documentaries and like Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom meant a lot. We were, that was exciting television to yeah. learn about the world because there wasn't the internet. We were being taught every day about, look, there's this, there's this, there's this. And I always found it fascinating. Yeah. And telling stories. Like my father would have all his friends over and they would just sit and tell stories. Yeah. And maybe that's why I'm an actor because I loved that part of storytelling. Yeah. That's awesome. And I'm going to steal that when I hear people say an incorrect fact about Star Wars. I'm just to say, well, <laughs> this is how it affected me and subtly work in that well, to be you fair, said something incorrect. We, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. We saw Rogue One. I know you're about to do a, a, a live show. Yeah. Or it may have been done it by this point. We saw Rogue One like the first night it came out. And I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I did not like Rogue One. I had so many problems with Rogue One. And then I heard everybody loved it. I'm like, what are they getting that I'm not getting? And I was yeah. like, Deborah, we've got to go see this again. <laughs> and we saw it a second time. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm I'm enjoying it this time. Right. You could at least see it from other what people loved about it. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm not going to go. No, if you like Rogue One, you're wrong. It's like, no, you got something out of it that I didn't. I want to see what that was. Yeah. Because I guess it's there, and it for some reason it just didn't hit me. Yeah. No, I totally understand. Uh, and and I'll be talking more about that. Uh. If a bear was blocking you from getting into a Shakespeare performance, would you try to get around the bear? I would exit pursued <laughs> by a bear. <laughs> this is the, the oddest stage direction that Shakespeare ever wrote yeah, from I Winter's Tale. Yeah. That is my answer. Okay, so you would find a way to make the bear exit, or yes. you would leave. I would exit, and I would be pursued by the bear. Oh, nice. So you would sacrifice your ability to see the Shakespeare show by drawing the bear away from the entrance, and other people would get to see the Shakespeare show. Of course. <laughs> I wouldn't want it to be unbearable for them. <laughs> Shakespeare like puns! <laughs> Here's the final question. Uh, I ask everybody. It is odd. The final how obsessed mm -hmm. are you question. If you couldn't read or watch Shakespeare without you or someone you love first being punched in the crotch, would you still read or watch Shakespeare? I would have to give it up. Really? I would think of all the wonderful things that, all my memories. Yeah. But I wouldn't want anyone to have pain for my pleasure. Fair enough. 
How much of Shakespeare do you think you have memorized that you could enjoy? I do. I remember moments from shows. Okay. I've seen some amazing productions of Shakespeare, and I would just hang on to those. Yeah. And go, well, Revels now are ended for me. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's like someone else is going to enjoy that. Yeah. But for me, that was that moment. I kind of like this story, this idea that some strange, horrible thing happens where people can't see Shakespeare, and other people like try to be like, I'm going to try to remember it. Like there's been an apocalypse. This is my post-apocalyptic Shakespeare that you have to try to remember and write down. Like, I think this is vaguely what was said and what happened. And it would morph into another beautiful Shakespeare. That would be wonderful. (laughs) Can you make a noise to sum up your obsession with Shakespeare? Sort of the rain it raineth every day I was going for. I was probably off a little bit. Okay. But... But yeah, that's in every that song is in every Shakespeare, and just that sort of you imagine the lute and the feeling, and yeah, and is that something? Does that come to you also just because it has a little bit of the rhythm of Shakespeare to it? Do you think that lute is meant to have a little bit of the ah, sort of a, a swing of Shakespeare? It, it became it became kind of a joke because for a while that was the only song they put in Shakespeare. Yeah, and you're like, oh come on, find something else. <laughs> and I'm like, no, the rain it rains every day. That's what uh, um, you know they're gonna sing. Mercutius is gonna sing it. Gonna sing it. It's like no, find another one. So it got installed in okay. my brain Shakespeare the rain it raineth every day because <laughs> you know if it was ha you know or maybe it's just good <laughs> <laughs> the yeah the, the Ian, Ian McKellen, McKellen. Nice, nice and he was completely naked in that production oh I thought in the big howl 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 the big oh, rain right. scene okay. he's took everything off and you're like well there's Ian McKellen for just a second I thought you meant when you encountered him in the street and complimented him mm, on his performance no, that good no. He, we would not have passed. <laughs> <laughs> Pursued by an Ian McKellen. Yes. Uh, I've been rating everyone's obsession on a scale of one to seven. I'll say out of uh, seven witches, because mm. we both like Macbeth. Uh, I'm going to say that you're like a uh, 5.75 obsessed. I shall accept that. Uh, because it sounds like you have uh, very much internalized it. It affects many, many different parts of your life. You appreciate it, obviously, on an emotional level, an intellectual level. But you do have a few stopping points. <laughs> like crotch punches. Hey, crotch punches. <laughs> Although they would find them funny in Shakespeare's day. Oh, yes, they would. Yes, they would. Uh, so we're going to have some quick plugs. Is there a place that people can find you online? Anything else you want to plug? I am on Twitter, uh, Darren DePaul on Twitter. I got a lot of stuff coming out that I can't talk about. Awesome. Um, <laughs> uh, there's an Amazon show uh, for little children called The Stinky and Dirty Show that I voice chip on. We're doing the second season of that. I can talk about it. And also the game Agents of Mayhem. Oh, nice. I can talk about that. Uh, Volition. Um, it, it's a Saints Row universe game, and I play the the villain, Dr. Babylon. Okay. And uh, I can talk about that. That will be out this year. <laughs> There's a great trailer that I just absolutely adored, and when I saw it, I'm like... And again, he's Shakespearean. He's one of those big monolog villains yeah. that I was like, oh, I'm so glad I'm playing this guy. Do you feel like you're getting known for that, that people are like, hey, you want a monolog villain? Go to Darren. They're, I'm kind of a machine or, or like the, the secret weapon. It's like, what do you do? I have this weird range that, yeah, I can do a chip and then do an orc. So they're like, well, (laughs) we can put him in this. We can put him in this. And as an actor, I love that. It's like, what am I playing today? Nice. Sometimes I'll go in for Blizzard and I won't know what I'm playing. And oh, they're just like, we need some guy. We need some extra stuff. Yeah. And you can do whatever. They'll show a picture. You'll have the lines. Mm -hmm. Him. Great. We all agree on that voice. Great. Do the lines. Let's move to the next guy. Okay, he's a this, he's a this, and you just go, I'm thrilled. This is why I got into acting. Awesome. It's to, you know, we've done improv, both of us, and it's like yeah. making those quick choices and those strong choices yeah. and those wonderful character beats. I love those. Awesome, awesome. Uh, here's some quick plugs, and then we'll mm-hmm. go on to our final questions. You can follow me in, on Twitter and Instagram is at Joseph Scrimshaw. You can follow Obsessed Podcast on Twitter is at Obsessed Podcast. For info on all my upcoming shows, you can check out my website at josephscrimshaw.com. You can support Obsessed by backing us on Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you get access to our monthly patron-only bonus episodes. For full info on that, go to patreon.com slash josephscrimshaw. Okay, final questions. Indeed. Don't have anything to do with your obsession, but you can force them to be about Shakespeare if you want. <laughs> If you could shoot one of these two things out of your hand, which would you want to shoot? Water or gold bricks? Gold bricks. <laughs> you could solve the problems of the world if you could shoot gold bricks out of your yeah. hand. And share them. And share them. Yeah. So you wouldn't just use them to hit people. You wouldn't uh, add there them There would your be play. people I would hit with it. <laughs> <laughs> there would be many people. But then you go, here, you right. look nice. Have a brick. 
<laughs> Thank you, sir. I can write much play again. Of course, Shakespeare. Enjoy your brick. <laughs> yeah, that'd be amazing to travel back in time and shoot a gold brick out of your hand. Shakespeare would for sure write a play about you then. Now, do you... I always wanted to travel back in time to that era. It's like, yeah. that's where I would go. But I'm afraid like, I'd die of dysentery or something. The yeah. minute you get there, every disease would hit you. And you're like, this is really great. It's a real play. And you're dead. Yeah, I would only want to travel there if I knew I could leave pretty quickly after exactly. and just like pop in for a minute. Yeah. yeah. No, I have no romance about living there. Okay. <laughs> Myself. If you could put your face on a product and it would always be on that product, what product would you want to put your face on? Like is an advertising thing. A video game? Okay. That I voiced? Yeah. That they're like, okay. So would you, you, would you want your actual image to be used for any of the characters you've played already? No, I mean, I'd rather be known for the work. I'm kind of, that's why I love voiceover because I like to hide behind the work. Yeah. So I don't know if, if I want my face on a game going, you know, this guy voices this. I'd say cookies because I like cookies, but who <laughs> wants to eat a cookie? They go, oh, it's a Darren cookie. <laughs> hey, it's kind of sweet, but I'm getting sick after a while. Uh, people eat Newman's own and it's all Newman, that's Newman, true. Newman face that's all the true. time. So maybe on like a fig bar of some kind. <laughs> I do enjoy a lovely fig bar. Okay. I so ex- let's go with that all instead right. of a game going, hey, look at me. I did a voice. <laughs> fig cookies. But y- if you do monologuing villains. Like I think you you are uh, very you have a very pleasant demeanor. Like you seem like a friendly person when people just see you. Thank you. But I think you also have the right uh, face and vibe. Like you could play a monologuing villain in a video game and use your actual image for a monologuing villain. Could that be like my rap name? <laughs> Mon- yo yo, I'm monologuing villain, and I'm here to say I'm going to rap in a villainous way. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a video game right now, right? Thank you. You you sold it. But that should happen. There's a comic book series called Kill Shakespeare in which all the Shakespeare worlds are brought together. Oh, nice. And the big villain who's controlling everything is, you know, the bard. Oh, So it's everyone getting together. If we kill the bard, we are free of this endless cycle that each of us in these plays are in. And I was like, that could be a video game. Those writers are brilliant. You're like, oh, so bring all the worlds of Shakespeare together. To play a game. Yeah. And would you want to be the bard? The big bad? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that'd be cool. Excellent. They get the best stuff. They really do. Villains get the best lines. Awesome. Uh, the final question for everyone on the podcast is, what is happiness? Happiness is my wife. Happiness is sharing those quiet moments and with somebody and being proud of somebody. When Deborah was on tour... Sorry, you're sitting right there. Um, when Deborah was on tour for two years, or she, we toured a lot. We didn't okay. see each other a lot. But I would love to go every night to the stage door when I'd visit and meet her and just walk home and say, how was the play? How was this? And it's just that simple, warm glow of knowing the person you love has done something they love. Yeah. And that makes you really, really happy. And yeah. Because because I'm this tortured artist guy, I, you know, and I'm Russian and French and Irish and Arab. That's my background. We're not a happy people. <laughs> and when Deborah came in my life, I really got happy and stayed happy. So I would say if you share your life with someone that you love and respect and can just have those moments just to be quiet and breathe. Yeah. I think that's a good like macro answer, but yeah. also uh, of of finding happiness with partnership with somebody else. But yeah. I love that micro answer too of the quiet moment, but the quiet moment after the big thing. Yeah, right. That's this sort of like just the go, moment after the storm. You yeah, know, even. To go, that happened. Yeah, that was nice. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much for doing the podcast. Thank you. I'm so glad to be on this. I listen to this podcast, <laughs> and I am overwhelmed that I get to be on it. Uh, thank I mean, you. Can't Joseph. wait for you to listen to yourself. That would be weird. <laughs> that would be. I don't listen in the games. They're like, do you play the games? And I'm like, I don't know. I couldn't do that. That'd be weird. So you're not going to listen to this episode? Yeah, I am now. Okay, good. Because you're looking at me and <laughs> put down the knife, Joseph Scrimshaw. My head knife eyes for just a second. I'm a nice person. <laughs> I really am. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That is our podcast. You've been listening to Obsessed. Joseph Scrimshaw and his guest shared some stories with the rest. Rate five stars if you're impressed. And now a little Shakespeare by Reinhardt from Overwatch. Ah, what need I be so forward with him that calls not on me? Well, tis no matter. Honor pricks me on. Yay. But how... If honor prick me off when I come on, how then? Can honor set to a leg? No. Or an arm? No. Or take away the grief of a wound? 
No! <laughs> honor has no skill in surgery then! No! What is honor? A word.